pictures of uh, some of the places that they they pe- some of the places and people or pets that they um, that they just really wanted to celebrate and uh, you know see God's goodness and creativity in creation and just kind of reminder of like last week when we started the series in Genesis about how God saw that it was good. So I want to just let you know that none of these pic I didn't Google any of these pictures. So these are all pictures that that people from River of Life actually took um, of their pets, of their of people that they loved, and um, places that they loved uh, that and just inspired that sense of God's goodness in creation. So we're just going to show some of those slides right now. last but not least so congratulations to Amy and Anthony for their grandson that was born last week so So let's stand together if you're able to sing all creatures of our God and King as we just see all those wonderful images some of those are very postcard worthy um, and just sing to our God um, our creator God Creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, oh praise Him, hallelujah, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam. Yeah. 
Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son. And praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, wonderful places and people and pets and animals that um, that we love and that we, we just are in awe of when we, when we encounter um, the beauty and creativity of all that you have done. So we do praise you, Lord. We do praise you. We sing hallelujah. You are worthy. You are worthy. the name of the world. 
Ah. Uh-huh. 
praise you. We praise you because all blessings flow from you. All glory, all beauty comes from you, Lord. And so we thank you and praise you as our creator, as our creator God who made all things simply because you spoke it. And so we thank you and we are awe and inspired by you once again, Lord. And so we thank you and open our hearts to your word uh, this morning and to our community here who are all created in your image. And praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And during this time, um, we're going to have um, Ms. Cheryl take the kids so the kids can head out with Ms. Cheryl for the kids part. We're going to have Pastor Abner come out. I, I just kicked the camera and all the online people's screen shook there. Sorry about that, guys. Um, my online peeps, I know you could hear me because um, I got the mic on. If, if we run into the problems with the sound, uh, just go ahead and text Carlos or Musette or both of them, and they could, they could handle any, any of the issues that are happening on there. Good morning, River of Life. You guys doing all right? Yeah, a little cold in here. By the way, we, we put in the work request for the heater. I think it's an electrical problem at, at, the, at the two screens there because they just don't turn on. Uh, but we do have a, a warm men's bathroom, or at least we did last week. So I, I don't know what's, what's going on there. So something is working, just not the screens on here. So bear with us. Uh, they put in that request. So uh, before we get started in the sermon, we're going to be, you know, obviously looking at uh, continuing in the book of Revelations. We're going to be looking at the creation of humanity. Uh, but before we go there, uh, the question that I have for you that I want you to share in groups or for those of you who are online, if you could um, use that, put, put them in gallery view. Uh, what is the most amazing thing that you have ever made? Okay, and this is a free for all. Um, it, it could be something at work. It could be something that you baked. Uh, maybe a poem that you wrote. Maybe it could, you know, anything basically. Um, where have you seen your creative energy at work you know, basically, what is the most amazing thing that you've ever made? So if, if, if we can get talking uh, for the next minute or two, just go ahead and sh share with the people around you. What are some of the most amazing things that you've ever made? Okay, well, let's pause the recording. Halloween costumes, okay, yeah. All right, Karen? Oh, your children, okay, all right. All right, awesome. Carlos has uh, a bunch of music that he's written and it's uploaded online, actually. He shared it, shared his creativity with me once and it's, it's awesome, totally rocking out. 
So anybody else? Yeah, go Carlos. <laughs> I'm making famous right now, man. <laughs> anybody else in the back? Yeah, go ahead, Amy. Okay, so uh, for those of you who are online, Amy's talking about her cooking. So, uh, yeah, then <laughs> people are asking for samples next week, you know, maybe for, for, for a Lunar New Year, maybe. <laughs> Spanish New Year. Okay, so I was trying to decide how to answer that question, and I think part of that is I... I, Molly knows I tend to be actually a, a you know a very creative person. So I, a few years of work, a few years ago, worked on the front yard. So I took the grass out, and hired somebody to do uh, some of the, the major you know uh, work out there. But then I started adding things. So it's like a canvas for me. You know what I mean? Like when I look out in the front yard, it it's uh, kind of like a painting, but with with uh, flowers, kind of like what what Jesse was doing in his parkway. Um, my backyard. For those of you who have been uh, over to our house. Everything back there is pretty much, you know, my creation. Um, a few months ago, I actually finished the kids' clubhouse. So for those of you who haven't been to, to, to my backyard, the kids have a clubhouse. And, and I was up there on the ladder watching Molly and the kids hanging out. And, and I'm like, okay, I'm done with this project, you know? Wait, up, why do the kids get a clubhouse and I don't have a space to hang out, you know? So then from that point on, this was last March, I, I started uh, making my garage into like a man cave. Uh, and that's been like my, my major project more recently. Um, so last week, Pastor Jesse uh, did a phenomenal job of introducing us to the book of Genesis. Uh, for those of you who weren't here last week, we're going to be looking at chapters one, two, and three, and looking at just th this, this concept of shalom, right? This idea in scripture that God created the universe to be a place where human beings and, and animals and plants are just constantly flourishing. Uh, and then human beings, right, have a good relationship with God. Uh, they have a good relationship with each other, with creation, and everything is kind of like, you know, in balance. And, and that's God's, you know, handiwork. Like God just kind of goes all out being creative um, with, with what he makes, right? And, and, and after every day of creation, he says uh, that it was good. And, and Jesse showed us this image where, again, the created order is flourishing. Uh, everybody is, is, is kind of like so joyful. You know what I mean? Like the, the, the animals, they, they don't look like they're going to bite me or anything. You know what I mean? Like uh, those, those uh, fish in the water, they don't look like they're going to uh, mess with anybody. Uh, so this morning, we're, we're going to continue looking at, at, at God's creation and specifically God's creation of, of humanity. And human beings actually have a unique place in the story of creation. We're looking again uh, at, at Genesis and some of these themes. Um, and we're going to look eventually how it all goes wrong, right? But I think before we, we, we jump into uh, the prophetic books, we need to understand, like, well, what was, what was God's intention? Like, why, where, uh, what was God's vision uh, about how things were supposed to be? Um, and, and here at the end of Genesis 1, we get a lot of details, in fact, more details than anything else about what happens when God goes to create human beings. And what I want to say is that um, uh, what's happening in, in Genesis 1 is it's kind of like it's building up to this, right? Like God has made the moon and the stars and like all the animals and everything, everything else, all the plants. Um, but but the, the creation of humanity is something spectacular. Right. It, it's almost like 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 it's a buildup and, and this thing is going to be awesome. Uh, so to help you understand like what's happening in the text, give give you a few examples. Like I'm a huge fan of the Christmas season. Advent, anybody? We just we just finished it. Um, and I think the first 24 verses of Genesis are like Advent. Right. And the creation of humanity is like Christmas morning. Right. Like Advent is cool because you get Christmas morning. But without Christmas morning, the rest of Advent, it's cool. But like. You know what I mean? You're, you're, you're actually looking forward to something, and that something is Christmas morning. The other uh, examples that I have for you about what's happening in the text, I'm a big cla uh, fan of classic rock, right? I, I love classic rock. I love me some Led Zeppelin. Uh, one of the greatest songs, uh, classic rock songs of all time is Stairway to Heaven, right, Carlos? 
And, and and well, Carlos probably has a lot of opinions about about other other rock songs that are probably uh, better in his, uh, you know. But in that particular song, it just builds up this crescendo to like this crazy guitar solo and you know going all nuts at the end. Um, and it's you know if you're listening to it, you're like, wow, you know that was, that was pretty amazing. Like, let me rewind that and do it again. Uh, I'm a big fan of football, right? So this this part of the text is kind of like the Super Bowl. Or if you like soccer, the World Cup. Y'all saw me crying a few weeks ago, right? When Messi had won the World Cup. Um, what's happening in the text is better than Messi uh, winning a World Cup. In other words, God is saving the best for last. Okay? The creation of humanity is the pinnacle of creation. And this is what it says, starting in verse 26. Then God said, let us make humans in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and, said, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Amen? Isn't that beautiful? Okay, so when I was writing yesterday, I actually felt called to talk uh, first about God's mandate, what he tells humanity, uh, before we, we, we actually tackle uh, what it means to be made in the image of God. That's the more important piece. So I want to like tackle that, give it a little bit more time. Uh, but I want to spend like a minute or two just talking about uh, what does God, you know, tell humanity? God creates humanity and, and then basically tells them immediately what we're supposed to do, right? Like what, what is our mandate? What, what are we built for? And, and uh, we were supposed to go out and multiply and to fill the earth. In other words, um, to make babies and make the world a better place. Somebody say hallelujah. All right, hallelujah, God is not a killjoy. Uh, I love that, that's a good vision. Go and multiply, praise Jesus. Um, but then he does something crazy. God actually puts humanity in charge of creation. Have you guys notice that? Um, the Lord makes the cosmos and humanity is put in charge of it to lead it, uh, to mold it, right? To have dominion over it, to subdue it. And, and, and in other Near Eastern religions of the time, uh, as Jesse told us last week, the gods made the world for themselves. It was their playground, and the rest of us were an afterthought, right? Or, or, or humanity, we were, we were basically made to be their slaves. But in, in nowhere in those narratives did it say that we actually had dominion or that we had control over anything. We were, again, an after, uh, afterthought, afterthought to them. Uh, they saw us as a cheap slave labor, right? We were nothing to them. We, we weren't created to rule with them. Uh, but the Bible says no, right? Like when, when, when the writers of scripture, the Hebrew scriptures looked at that creation narrative, it's like, no, that's not who humanity is. In the Bible, humanity is given the task of ruling uh, with God over creation, not as servants to creation, uh, not as servant to other gods, but as co-rulers with God. And you know what? Some people will actually, uh, some people throughout history have read the scripture and have used it to justify all kinds of crazy exploitation of the environment, right? But that's not what it means to rule here. Um, in, in, in the Hebrew, or at least what's happening in this text, dominion and, 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 and that word subdue uh, of creation uh, does not mean that we get to destroy creation and, and use it uh, for whatever selfish purposes uh, we see fit. To have dominion in Genesis is to use all of our creativity and intellect to mobilize the resources that have been given to, uh, given to us to make the earth a better place. It has to do with cultivating the land, uh, learning methods of irrigation. It has to do with, with domesticating animals, right? Uh, we were meant to take care of the earth like Pastor Jesse takes care of his garden. Uh, do, do we have that picture up? Right, we were supposed to take what the Lord has given us and, and make it more beautiful. By the way, have they grown some more in the last week, week and a half, with all the rains? 
more seedlings. So it's going to get crazy. Um, God gives us conscious, right? He gives us creativity, self-awareness, spiritual discernment to have dominion as he, as he does. And again, at no point does this dominion have anything to do with the exploitation of creation, right? Dominion of subduing have nothing to do with abusing, neglecting, uh, destroying the land or, or you know, uh, uh, destroying the oceans or the air that we breathe or, or other animals or other human beings. Man, they just decided to... to for those of you who are online, we got, we got a leaf blower on the other side of this thing. It's just, I'm sorry, I'm just tripping out right now. Um, where am I in my notes? No, we're, we're not supposed to destroy any of those things. Uh, God said that it was good, right? And, and, and we need to see it as good. Uh, and there are Christians out there that don't think that we need to consider... Uh, that we don't need to concern ourselves with issues of the environment, right? That the only thing that matters is the soul. And in my opinion, that's just garbage theology, right? Like that, that is permission to do whatever we want with creation. And I don't think that's, that's what uh, is happening in the text. As Christians, we, we have to see that everything that God has created is good and that we have to be stewards of it. Uh, one of the people actually that has done uh, a lot of thinking on this and at, actually has stepped up to talk about uh, these issues is Pope Francis. Um, most of you are not Catholic and, and don't really, you know, think about what the Pope is writing. But back in 2015, he wrote an encyclical. An encyclical is like a major work of theology called uh, Laudato Si. And it is said to be the, one of the most comprehensive documents on the environment and how Christians should be interacting with the environment that has ever come out. Of, uh, of the church. And when it came out, I remember this. Uh, the reason that, that I remember this is because uh, I was watching CNN and they said, yeah, you know, like the, the, the Pope just came out with this encyclical. And, and CNN, the people, the, you know, the anchors of CNN, were just, they were just confused. They were like, um, why is the church worried about these things? You know, he should stick to, to <laughs> on CNN, say he should stick to saving souls. And I was like, now, wow, have we given up so much on thinking about having dominion that even non-Christians on CNN are saying, y'all should not be worrying about the environment, you know? Uh, y'all should just be worrying about saving souls. So I think most of us don't think about these things, right? Don't think about the environment on a daily basis or what it has uh, to do with our faith. And part of the reason is uh, all of us live in a major city, right? Uh, the vast majority of us are not farmers, right? None of us are here farmers. None of us... Uh, the only thing, time we think about Mother Nature is when Mother Nature starts messing with us, right? Like Molly and I, our, our backyard flooded. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's been flooding almost on a daily basis right now because the rains won't stop. And that's the only time that I think about the environment, you know? Uh, and it's because it's messing with me. You know, I, uh, the other night at midnight, I, I kid you not, the water came within an inch of my sliding door and I had to start taking... Uh, things out of our den because I seriously thought the water was going to come in. And that's really the only time, right, that I think about the environment. Um, we don't normally spend time in nature. Uh, but personally, I think I'm, I'm reminded of the goodness of creation when I'm in a place like Yosemite. I like that's one of my famous, uh, uh, one of my favorite places on earth. I, I did a search for Ansel Adam in, in the program that we use. I'm fairly certain this is not Ansel Adam. But if you've ever been there, uh, the valley is maybe at some points like half a mile to a mile wide, but you've got these granite cliffs on both sides that go up 3,500 to 5,000 feet. And it is just the most spectacular, beautiful thing um, that personally I've ever seen. And, and when I'm in the valley, I'm reminded of God's love, God's beauty, God's creativity, right? I, I understand, I think at that point, that a place like Yosemite is a place that should not be destroyed and should not be exploited, but needs to be stewarded. So God created human beings and made them rulers over the rest of creation. Uh, there's a lot more that we can say about that, but I won't because I really want to uh, turn our attention now to what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Um, the Genesis account of creation, the creation of humanity is different than other creation narratives, as Pastor Jesse told us about last week, right? The Babylonian creation narrative, the Enuma Elish, said that humanity was made out of the result of this war between the gods, uh, that we were their slaves. And that way of understanding humanity would have us believe that we're some kind of cosmic, uh, cosmic mistake, right? That it just happened, that we were like an afterthought. In Genesis, uh, it's the complete opposite. Like I said, we are the pinnacle of creation. There was no chaos. We were not a mistake. 
Um, there was intention. Uh, God wanted to make us. Um, human beings are not, not an accident, but, uh, an accident, but we are made in the image of God. And this, uh, this concept is, is usually when, when you do the research and reading, and if you want to look at anything that has to do with, you know, uh, uh, the image of God, they, they usually use the term imago Dei. Uh, and it is a belief that human beings are unique, that we are not a mistake, but made in God's image. And the fact that we are made in God's image is actually repeated in the text a few times, right? Let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness. So God created human beings in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. And, and the text is going out of the way to communicate that what? We are made in the image of God. Uh, now, the word that is being used here, this word image in the Hebrew is the word selem. And the word in the Old Testament, this particular word, is, is used to, uh, to describe uh, like a statue. Um, and, and, and it's used, you know, these statues, in two different ways. To, to look at a political reality or, or uh, to, to uh, look at an object of worship. Right, so a salem. Let, let's let's begin with the first one. Salem as as a political reality. Salams were the statues of the king or the kings that were placed all around the kingdom to remind everybody who, of who was in control. Right. So uh, uh, a few hundred years later, after this was written, uh, the bust of Caesar Augustus was everywhere. Right. And and a lot of kings did this. And, and they wouldn't just place it like in the middle of town. They would place it in the outskirts as you were entering to basically to signify you are entering such and such person's uh, reign. Okay. Uh, in the New Testament times, again, uh, the emperors had their salams or statues all over the kingdom. And the United States, what's our salam? Our image that signifies a certain political reality. The American flag. Uh, the Statue of Liberty, yes, also, but more than likely, uh, most of the time, it's the American flag. It's a reminder of our values, our power, uh, uh, American uh, the reign, you know. Uh, we went to the moon, and what did we do? The United States. We put our salam on the moon. You know what I mean? How, like, have you thought about how crazy that is, right? Uh, uh, the reason I like these pictures is because, you know, oftentimes, you know, in, in some of our neighborhoods, you get the kids going around tagging, you know, uh, defacing people's property. Uh, this is no different. You know what I mean? I mean, nobody lives on the moon, but this is like, like American tagging on the moon. You know what I mean? I'm going to tell you uh, who this particular neighborhood belongs to. My, and the moon doesn't belong to anybody. Uh, but that particular image, right, the American flag, it represents something. Uh, it means something. It is an image that represents freedom, the pursuit of happiness, uh, the freedom uh, to worship however you want. We will talk about, you know, in, in later sermons, how that image uh, uh, does not always live up, you know, uh, to our ideals, like in honesty, right? Like some people look at the flag and they're like, yeah, I don't know about that. Um, but for now, I encourage you to focus on the positive aspects of this uh, particular image. Uh, for most of my life, you know, I've, I've taken the American flag for, for granted. But then Molly and I w were on a mission trip a few years back uh, to the Middle East, uh, to a country that didn't have the same values and, and the same freedom of religion that we have in the United States. And every building in that country had that country's flag on it that represented uh, their set of values. And that salam, that image, um, didn't really allow us to, to completely share our faith in parts of the country in ways that we would have wanted to, because it, had we shared our faith, uh, we would have probably been questioned and maybe thrown in jail. And I can't tell you how happy I was for the first time in my life when we landed at JFK airport and I saw the American flag on top of a building, right? Uh, why? Well, it's because it represents something. It, it gives us, um, it, it, it says there, there's a certain way of governing, there's a certain way of doing things in this place and this salem uh, is, is marks that, okay? Um, but human beings, right? Human beings are the salams of God, right? We, we're supposed to be a reminder, representation of God to the rest of creation, right? This means that, that when we walked into a forest or, or into a field or to a mountaintop or when we jumped into the ocean and the rest of God's created uh, order gazed on, on us, that, that, they were, that they were supposed to be reminded of God and God's kingdom and God's reign, right? We were meant to be God's handiwork, God's pinnacle creation to the rest of the cosmos. We were evidence 
to the rest of the created order that God exists. Isn't that awesome? So it means that, that, that we're made in the image of God. Now, Salem, like I said, is also a religious uh, image. And, and Salem is a word that the Old Testament uses to describe the, the graven images of, of pagan worship, right? So pagan idols, uh, one of the main judgments that the prophets brought against the people of Israel time and time again is that they had forsaken God for Salem's made by human hands. In other words, you guys gave up on the idea of God. You guys gave up on God's kingdom, and you began to worship uh, these idols that you made for yourself. So if you ever see the word graven idol or idol or pagan idol or something like that in the text, if it's uh, in the Old Testament, more than likely, it's going to be the word uh, Salem. So Salem's were, were the statues, right? That they, and, and these statues, they were supposed to have the very essence of their God in them. So if you worship the idol, it was the same as worshiping uh, that particular God. And in Genesis, we are the Salem of God, of Yahweh. At a spiritual level, we represent Yahweh, right? Uh, all of who God is, is represented uh, in us. Our very existence, the reason that we were created was to declare the glories of the kingdom of God, again, to all of creation. We are not a cosmic mistake. Right, we're not like a freeway sign. We're not like you know, like a McDonald's sign, or look, think about any other sign that you've ever seen in your entire life. We're we're unlike anything that we've ever made. We reflect the creativity and the authority of God to the rest of creation. Amen. Amen. So I thought that it would be good at this point to talk about the implications of that, right? Because it's one thing to understand, yeah, you know, we're made in the image of God, but, but what does that mean? What, what are the consequences of that? What are, how are we supposed to carry ourselves? Um, the first implication, I think, is, uh, uh, you know, all human beings have intrinsic value and dignity. All human beings. And, and I love this quote from uh, Martin Luther King. He says, the whole concept of the image of God is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected. And this gives man a uniqueness. It gives him worth. It gives him dignity. And we must never forget this. There are no gradations, gradations in the image of God. Every man from the treble white to a base black is significant on God's keyboard, precisely because every man is made in the image of God. One day we will learn that. We will know one day that God made us to live together as brothers and to respect the dignity and worth of every man. Includes women too, okay? He was writing at a time when uh, sometimes they didn't include women. But Martin Luther King is saying that all people, right? All people from the whitest white person to the blackest black person and everybody in between, every shade that you could find, um, that we are all made in the image of God, all tribes, all nations, people of every ethnicity and culture. And I have some pictures there, Musette, that you want to go through. Uh, people of every religion, right? People who don't believe in God are made in the image of God. People with disabilities are made in the image of God. No, no matter where you come from, uh, made in the image of God. Men and women are made in the image of God. Right, and as a side note, it's interesting to me that in a book of scripture that is often used to oppress women or to subjugate women or to silence women, you have the text honoring women and acknowledge them specifically. So God created humans in his image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. I, I, you know, I think the authors are going out of the way. Um, that's almost as if to say to the men reading the text, let me remind you that women are also made in my image. Right, uh, God did not make women less than. Women are also co-rulers over creation with God, right? Like women were also given a dominion in this passage. All human beings are made in the image of God. Uh, so this means that from a biblical perspective, uh, we also have no right to exploit, to enslave, to abuse, to destroy, to manipulate, to disregard any individual human being or groups of people on the face of the planet. Right To do any of those things is to destroy the Salem of God. And I want you to think about um, uh, how it is that, that people will trip out if you burn the American flag. Right? I, got, I got a friend. Uh, you get, some of you guys know David Perez. Uh, he's been in the military for his entire adult life. Uh, he has sacrificed a lot to, to protect uh, the American flag. And if somebody were to desecrate an American flag in front of David or anybody who's been in the military, they're just going to go crazy, you know? 
uh, because they give their life to that. Um, that is the same response that we should have whenever we see exploitation or abuse or manipulation of, of anybody. The destruction and exploitation of human life says that we don't care about God's authority and God's rule over all of creation. Uh, it is impossible to hate or enslave the Salam of God and say that we love God, right? That's just, those two things just don't go together. Um, if human beings were, are made in his image and we destroy that image, then we don't have love for God. And seriously, that's just a preview of the prophets, right? I'm just giving you a preview of, of, of what is coming. Uh, we're all made in his image. There is value in, in all human beings, everyone. Amen? Okay. So let me talk about the second implication connected to the first. Because all human beings are made in the image of God and have value and dignity, then we must do our best to seek the image of God of everybody and everybody we interact with. Um, and I think this one's hard, hard for us, and I'll, and I'll, I'll share a few of my experiences. Um, I love this, this quote from John Calvin. We are not to reflect on the wickedness of men, but to look to the image of God in them, an image which covering and obliterating their faults, an image which by its beauty and dignity should lure us to love and embrace them. And I think Calvin acknowledges our tendency as Christians sometimes, I think, to focus on people's faults, right? Like we, we, we love that story of, of, of um, and rightfully so, a story of redemption uh, and forgiveness. Um, but, but sometimes I think to a fault, like when we look at people, you know, we, we judge, you know, uh, especially when we interact with non-Christians or with people who have wronged us, we're quick to judge people. We're really quick uh, to, to label people. I think it's just something that we do naturally. Uh, and I think it is true that all human beings are broken and, and, in, and, need in, and in need of redemption, but that's the rest of the biblical narrative. Today, we're just focusing on uh, what it means to be made in the image of God. The fact of the matter is that even our enemies, even people who have wronged us, uh, even people who have taken advantage of us are made in the image of God, broken, but still made uh, in the image of God. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to excuse people for the things they, they do to us. I'm just trying to bring perspective, theological perspective on the situation, right? Uh, that there's intrinsic value uh, in people. And in my experience, right, it's really easy to de demonize people. I think when I'm mad or when we're angry, uh, when we're afraid, we always put people in that other category, right? And I think that that other category is the beginning of dehumanization, right? As soon as we begin saying those people or, or us versus them, that's just the beginning of, uh, of an exploitation of people groups. Uh, and, and, and that dehumanization is, is, is a threat or an affront on the, on the kingdom of God. Right? So we have to do everything that we can to interact with people as if they were made uh, in the image of God. And, and there have been times you know, in my life where people have hurt me, that I've gotten so angry. Uh, and, and I wouldn't say that I say this out loud, but they just stop becoming people to me. You know what I mean? Uh, they just stop be becoming human. You get so angry. Uh, I've had people in ministry that I have disagreed with, that have wronged me, that in all honesty have made my life and Molly and I in our life just sometimes you know, uh, kind of like a living hell. And it was not a lot of fun uh, to be in ministry with those people. They made it so, so difficult, you know, at times where we feel like we couldn't live out our calling. Um, and because they made my life difficult, I just kind of gave up on that relationship, right? I was just like, I, I can't even deal with this anymore. Um, you know, and as, as a side note, I think sometimes we do need to put relationships on pause for good reason, right? If, if there are people who are abusing us or like continuing, you know, certain patterns of like messing with us, then it's okay to put, uh, put things on, on pause. But, but what I'm arguing is that we don't have the right to dehumanize people, right? I, again, I've given up on, on relationships, uh, stop caring about people. Uh, and I think in those instances, just forget that people are human beings, you know? Um, some of my friends recently shared on, on Facebook that they're getting a divorce, uh, people that Molly and I were in ministry with, people that that we love genuinely, and let me tell you, man, it was it was sad. It was a heartbreaking story. Um, but we've grown so far so far apart, right? That I couldn't even pick up the phone and say, "Hey, brother, hey, sister, I I saw that what got posted, uh, and I'm sorry that you're going through that." Why? Because I think in my heart, they've almost stopped becoming human beings. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I judged them because of the chaos that they caused. It was real. 
Um, but my heart grew, you know, hard and bitter towards them. Um, and and I, I want to argue that even, even our enemies are made in the image of God, right? And we have to do everything that we can do to remember that. Um, when I came to faith, one of my favorite authors uh, to read was C.S. Lewis. For those of you who don't know C.S. Lewis, he was a great defender of the faith in the 20th century, uh, wrote the Chronicles of, of Narnia, for those of you who, who have read that. Um, and he had just a way of writing that made sense to me, right? I think especially in, in my early years as a Christian, I used to love reading C.S. Lewis. And, and uh, C.S. Lewis reminds us that when we interact with people every day, that we're actually interacting with people who are, who are one day going to be immortals, okay? That, that someday the people we interact will either be in new creation with the Father if they choose to give their lives to the Lord, or they will be in eternal damnation, right? Like uh, either or. Uh, but that either way, the people that we interact with, he says, are not, there are no ordinary people that you ever, ever interact with. And this is what he says. He says, it is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhel uh, overwhelming possibilities, it is in the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is ours as a life of a gnat. But it is, it is with immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit, immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. And what he's saying is like, when you're interacting with people, you know, you need to be, be careful, right? Because um, it's going to end up one of these ways, and you don't want to be uh, uh, leading people to a destination that we wouldn't want for ourselves. When we interact with people, we are interacting with God's creation. We are interacting with God's image. We cannot take our daily interactions with our friends, with our family, and our enemies lightly. You and I don't get to choose how people live their lives. We don't get to uh, make decisions for them. Um, we don't get to say uh, where they end up for all of eternity, uh, but we do choose how we interact with them and how we see them, how we view them. And we have to seek the image of God in everybody that we interact with. Now, I'm not saying that this is easy at all. And, and let me give you uh, an example that's, that's current right now, uh, ongoing at the moment, that's live, you know what I mean? Um, last Christmas, Molly's mom said something to me that she shouldn't have. Um, very painful, very disrespectful. Uh, there's no need to repeat it. But she shouldn't have said, you know, what she said. And to be honest, uh, stuff like that happens in families, I think, all the time, you know. Uh, I've, I've told some of the guys, and they're like, yeah, you know, like, I've, I've, I've been there. Um, so this thing happened. The other thing that you need to know is that um, growing up, I had a lot of traumatic experiences where people did things and said things to me all the time, you know. <laughs> like, I just grew up, you know, in a crazy family. Um, and as a child, I didn't have a say about whether or not we hung out with those people because they were family but as an adult, I get to say who I want to hang out with and who I don't want to hang out with. And at my age, right, I'm going on 45 uh, later on this month. I don't want to hang out with people that disrespect me or hurt me. You know, I, I think that's kind of where I'm at right now in life. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't choose out of it as a child, but I'm choosing out of it as, as an adult. So I think this, this last year has been very difficult for us, right? And, and in particular for Molly, um, because I, I haven't really wanted to hung, hang out with her mom, you know? And I think that the challenge for me in this particular situation is to not overlook the image of God in my mother-in-law. Uh, because let me tell you, she is a beautiful human being. Uh, there are things about Jane that I just totally love. Um, and in my anger, I need to, and in my hurt, right? I don't think I'm angry anymore, I'm just hurt. I need to remember those things. Now, for the time being, um, I'm actually, you know, started going to counseling, right, to help me deal with like all the craziness 
that happened to me when, when I was a kid so that I won't get triggered, not just with my mother-in-law, but with anybody, you know what I mean? Um, and then I think um, learning strategies at, you know, to deal with people who hurt me and are disrespectful with me in the future, because guess what? That's going to happen to me to, for the rest of my life. So I can't go on the rest of my life getting triggered and wanting to like bail on relationships, right? So I'm, I'm working on it. Um, I'm not letting myself off the hook. Why do I share the story with you? Because it's live, right? It's, normally you don't like share crazy stories until there's a redemption piece, you know, uh, or at least that's the way that we like it. Uh, I share it because I don't have to convince any of you here that humanity in general is made in the image of God. That's not a hard sell, right? All people groups, yeah, made in the image of God. Uh, but see the image of God in people who are personally hurting us, that's a harder pill to swallow. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, think about the people who have hurt you. Think about the people that, that mess with you. Uh, it's not easy to see the image of God in them. But personally, I think if we're going to have credibility and being able to see the image of God in all people, that needs to include uh, people who hurt us. Again, it doesn't mean that we stay in those relationships, right? Like sometimes we need to put a pause. Sometimes we, we need to walk away. Um, but let's not ever be people who have that us versus them mentality. Again, that's easier said than done. Uh, where I grew up, your enemy was your enemy. That was them. They were not human, you know? Uh, the people who hurt you, you destroy them. That's just how I grew up, right? And Jesus teaches me to live a different way. That all makes sense? I'm not, again, I'm not arguing for giving up on relationships. I think we just need perspective, right? We, we need to uh, realize that we're never interacting with ordinary people. Right? Uh, in Lewis's words, it is with immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. It's a lot. Live. Um, the last implication uh, I want to address is related um, to how we see ourselves. And, and what I want to say is uh, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. It's not just that humanity or your enemies or the people. No, you, when you look in the mirror, do you believe that? Do you believe that you're made in the image of God? And, and I think that some of us in this room have no problem believing that humanity in ger- general is made in the image of God, uh, but maybe you have difficulties believing that the reflection that you see in the mirror is made in the image of God. Um, and I think this could happen for a v- variety of reasons. Uh, maybe you grew up in a neighborhood or in a family where it was okay to put people down. Or maybe, uh, you know, people made fun of you, and at first it was a joke, but, th- but then, you know, it became an insult, and, it, and you internalized it. I remember, like, one of these stories that just really broke my heart a few years ago. It was a story that, that, I, that I saw in the news where, where there were reports that there's some child abuse happening at home, and, and the cops, you know, basically, officers went and knocked on the door, and this five-year-old child uh, opens the door, and, you know, the officers are, hey, you know, are you, uh, what's your name? And the child responded, oh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm idiot. My name is idiot. Why? Uh, because that child's parents, every time that they called the child, they, they called the child an idiot. So people come, you know, to, to save the kid. And the child responds, oh, I'm um, idiot, you know? Um, maybe someone you love and respect makes it a habit of putting you down. They don't see the image of God in you, so they say things that are hurtful. Um, comments about your weight, your intellect, your gender, your sexual orientation, your mental health, the way you talk, the language that you speak. Maybe people have said something about your ethnicity and your culture. I mean, seriously, I can go on and on, right? Um, and when you look in the mirror, you don't see the Imago Dei looking back at you. Uh, like I've shared before, I grew up in a neighborhood that was 99% Latino, so I never gave much thought about what it meant to be brown until I went to UCLA. And I, I had heard stories about racist people, um, but in my neighborhood, I was a majority, right? So th- those, those actually racist stories probably went the other way, you know what I mean? It's like, uh, if, if you ask some of the white kids in my neighborhood, they probably felt like uh, we were racist towards them, and I'm pretty sure that we were looking back on it. Um, but I didn't know what racism was, at least not racism directed towards me, because where I grew up, we were the majority. Um, and I went from being in the majority to being in the minority. 
No one in the dorms at UCLA wore baggy pants that they bought at the indoor swap meet like I did. <laughs> you know what I mean? That was just not the experience. People are there like, indoor swap meet? Man, are you poor? I'm like, yeah, actually, I am, dude. <laughs> Uh, none of them, uh, I used to wear solo brand pants and solo brand, what was cool about them. And, and I, I'm, I'm trying to see, uh, looking online, I wonder if Abraham ever wore solos. That m- might be a little bit too young, but, but solos were like, just like one big tube. You know what I mean? Like they were just like baggy pants. They would cover your feet. So, so when, when I walked, my entire foot would have just been my pant, you know? <laughs> they didn't even flare out like bell bottoms. Uh, they're kind of like like uh, uh, tagger pants from the from the early '90s. <laughs> um, none of my friends or n- nobody at UCLA wore bandanas to keep the hair out of their face. So when I work out, worked out, I, I use a bandana, you know. And then people automatically think you're a gangster because you got a bed. Well, I guess the solo pants didn't help, but. <laughs> Most of them did not grow up in poverty, you know? None of their friends looked like gangsters. Man, I got some pictures of my friends visiting me at the dorms, and I'm like, these guys just look like thugs. And they're not thugs, but man, they just look gangster, you know what I mean, compared to everybody else. Um, most of my friends at UCLA, their parents had, you know, jobs that were considered respectful. None of them had grown up undocumented. And I can go on and on and on and on, you know? And after a while, I just began to believe that Latinos were not beautiful. And I would say that that happened pretty quickly because you see the contrast, right? You're like, well, that's not me. That's not you. Like, you know, and you're questioning yourself all the time. And I didn't realize, but I had internalized, right? The false narratives about my people and the place where I'd grow up. Uh, It was, you know, and it became painful when I would study passages like these because like made in the image of God. Yeah, right. You know, um, I think it was easy for me to see the Imago Day in other people, but I had been called a lazy wetback, a stupid beaner, a ghetto Latino so many times that I couldn't believe in the image of God in me and my people. Um, when people use their words to degrade you, you begin to believe what they say. You forget about it, right? And, and I think what changed for me were, were, were passages like Psalm 139, which I want to share with you right now. Uh, it, it, it turned uh, around for me in Psalm 139, where David reflects on, on the fact that God is with him all the time and the fact that God has made him. So l- let me read this passage for you. Psalm uh, 139, started, starting on verse 13. For it was you who formed my inward parts, this is David speaking, uh, basically writing the psalm to the Lord. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. I know that very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. And, And these are thoughts that God is having of him. You know what I mean? How weighty are your thoughts of me, God? How vast are some of them? I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to an end. I'm still with you. And David says that God knit them together in his mother's womb, right? That God was involved in the process of making David, that David was not a, a mistake, that God saw David when David was still unformed, that God uh, uh, wrote David's name in his book of life before David uh, came to be. And what David is saying is, Lord, you are so about me. You know, (laughs) you are so about me. Look at how much you think of me, Lord. I'm overwhelmed thinking of you thinking of me. How awesome are you, Lord? And and if you've ever been in love, like, you know what David is talking about. When you fall in love with somebody, you think about them all the time, you know? And and, and David is like, uh, you think about me all the time, Lord. It's awesome. Uh, You're really for me, Lord. But the real kicker for me is verse 14. I praise you. I give you praise because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. I know that full well. And what he's saying is I am an awe-inspiring creation. You make good things, Lord. Right? When was the last time that you had that thought about yourself in a non-arrogant way? You know what I mean? <laughs> Not like, man, I look good today. But, but really, I'm a beautiful creation. Thank you. Thank you for making me who I am. 
And I think once I realized that I was fearfully and wonderfully made, that my ethnicity, my culture, and my barrio upbringing were part of God's, uh, God's plan for me, um, I realized that I had a place in God's plans. And there was no stopping me after that, you know? Not in, again, not in an arrogant way, but in a confident way, because I knew what role I played before the throne of God and in God's purposes in the universe. So river of life. Um, what I want to encourage you to believe is that every single one of us in this room is made in the image of God. Who you are, your ethnicity, your gender, the place that you were born, the neighborhood you grew up with, uh, in all those things have shaped you. It doesn't matter where you come from or what other people think. Uh, everyone in here is the Salem of God. Uh, I, I usually drop my kids off at school and I've gotten into the habit over the last few years of, of actually parking uh, two or three blocks away from the campus and walking them. And as I walk them to class and they're about to go up the stairs of the ramp, I, I tell them, uh, especially Santiago, because he's at that age where, you know, the kids are making fun of each other. I'm like, your son, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And don't forget that. I don't, I don't know what's being said and I haven't even asked them. But, but I'm just going to assume, right, that they're going back and forth, making fun of each other, because uh, I used to do that when I was a kid. Well, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, whatever they say about you, it hurts, but ultimately it doesn't matter. You're made in the image of God, son. So it doesn't matter where you come from and what people think of you. You are the Salem of God. Uh, we are all broken and in need of redemption, but, the, but made in the image of God nonetheless. So... In closing, I, I would like us to reflect on, on, on a final question. And I'm going to give, uh, especially the introverts, two minutes uh, to reflect on this question. So what I mean by that is, this is going to be a silent two minutes, okay? For, so, so you extroverts, you're getting two minutes too. Um, <laughs> how do you see the image of God reflected in you and in your people group? <laughs> How do you see the image of God reflected in who you are and in your people group? Okay. Put a pause on the recording. Use that if you want to. Um, now I want you to turn to your neighbors and share with them. How is the image of God reflected in you and in your people group? Let's do that for a few minutes. Then I'll bring us back together and we're going to pray to the Lord together, okay? There's also a struggle. In prayer? You know, I don't know what so, it was like for you all I, to talk about how you see like, the image of God. Whether I'm successful but, um, in abstinence or not, more I'm still valued by God. And I like put, that. Put the last slide up here. That I was uh, we, we, God. We've learned a lot today, knows right? Me, so knows me, regardless as, as a review. Or not. Uh, humanity was created in the image of God. Therefore, these are the implications that we talked about. All people have value and dignity. We must do our best to seek the image of God in everyone we interact with. And then all of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. If we could maybe, maybe stand up and, and just, just pray off of that. I, I can lead us in prayer, but, but uh, if, there's, uh, if there were other things that the Lord is bringing up for you in this particular sermon, I would love for us just to, to maybe respond together as a community and, and praise, praise the Lord. Jesse, do you want to come up and do a little bit of Holy Spirit music. Um, yeah, let's 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 stand up and and res respond in prayer to the Lord. Molly, do you have something the Lord putting on your heart? Yeah, yeah. Lord, we just God, we thank you. We thank you that we're not some cos cosmic mistake. Lord, we thank you that there was purpose in creating us. Lord, we thank you that we are made in your image. God, that we. We get to be representatives to all of creation of your goodness and your kingdom. Uh, Lord, we, we know that this vision that you had in the book of Genesis, um, that it gets uh, turned on its head in the next chapter, Lord. Uh, but for now, we just want to give glory to you, Lord. God, we want to give you thanks. Father, I, I thank you for um, our backgrounds, Lord, our ethnicities, our, our cultures. Lord, thank you for the d diversity in this room, Lord. Uh, we mourn that. Uh, that there are not other people groups represented here. But for now, we rejoice in what we do have. Lord, I, I thank you for the ways that all of us are uh, reflect your image in very unique ways, that our people groups, uh, the places that we come from, represent your image in very unique ways. 
Uh, Lord, for those of us who have been uh, told that we're not made in your image, that, that, that believe something that, that is not of you, Father, I, I pray that we would t- take time to maybe reflect uh, today, maybe get some prayer and say, yeah, you know, I have a hard time believing that I'm made in the Im- image of God. So Lord, would, would you take us there, Lord? God, would you help us um, interact with people around us, Lord, as, as if they were not ordinary? Also, Lord, God, would you help us see the image of God and people that we disagree with and people that hurt us? And Lord, that, that's not to say that we, we put up with abuse, but, but I pray that we would not be tempted to have that us versus them type of mentality that dehumanizes people. So Lord, we love you, we thank you. So if, if I'm gonna just open it up, if, if you feel like praying something out loud, just go ahead and, and, and pray it out loud and, and loud, because we, we don't have the mic. Do you want a mic? Do we have a mic? Molly has a mic, Never mind. Yeah, you can pass it around if you feel led to pray out loud. Lord put on your heart um, I just wanted to echo what Abner was saying it's um, just let's keep our eyes closed and just be in a posture of prayer it's hard um, sometimes for us to believe that we are fearfully and wonderfully made um, but my sense was when Abner was talking about that it's tender for us it's tender for us because we often have heard other things and um, but our deep Honestly, our, one of our deepest longings is to know that we are loved and seen and known and enjoyed. And, and I believe that God wants to help us take that in. And so I'm just going to um, just pray for us. So Holy Spirit, would you come now? And would you help us have a sense of Jesus' shining face of love towards us? So just imagine that in your mind whether you can see Jesus's face or maybe it's like you just feel his presence like the sun and you're kind of basking in it. Just just take that in. Jesus is shining face of love towards you. And I just want to invite you to ask Jesus, what is it that he enjoys about you? Just ask Jesus, what do you enjoy about me? And just see if anything comes to mind. whether sometimes hearing from God is easy, sometimes it's hard. Something might have come or not, but didn't doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't enjoy you. Jesus enjoys you. And so Jesus, we just thank you that you speak to each one of us, that we are very enjoyable, that you enjoy us, that you're happy to be with us. Just think about one of the things of your personality. What's one thing about you that you like about yourself or what's an aspect of your personality? Jesus, thank you that you have made us that way intentionally. That you, yeah, you, you, you know that about us and that you love us. You love that you made us that way. And I just pray that that would give us joy. Um, right now that our souls would be filled with joy that you love us, that you love to be with us, that you have enjoyed who you've made us to be. And I pray that we'd be able to take that in from you right now. So just continue to bask in Jesus's love for you. Just take 30 seconds and just sit still and just receive his love, his enjoyment of you, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made.
You are not a mistake, but you are woven together in your mother's womb, and you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And Jesus, we ask that you would help us to take that truth in, not just in our minds, but into the deepest parts of our souls, the parts that are so thirsty to know that that's true. God, would you help us take that in? And would you also help us have a shining face of love back towards one another, that we would reflect to one another that they also are made that in the image of God, and that with our whole being, with our face, with our body language, with our tone of voice, would we be able to enjoy one another as an act of um, partnering with you to bless those around us, Lord to reflect. I guess, Lord, we ask that you would shine your love through us to those around us here at River of Life, but also just all that we come in contact with, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. My Jesse to lead us in a closing song. Build my life. Starting from the bridge. And I will build Upon your love, it is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. I will build. you that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made by your love and in your love and with your love Lord we thank you and praise you pray this in Jesus name Amen All right, I'm going to close this out with announcements a couple thoughts um, just some practical encouragement off of the message um one thing I just want to encourage, some of us are good at receiving compliments, and some of us, it's really hard for us. <laughs> we prefer to bless other people, but like receiving compliments is really hard. So I just encourage you, when somebody compliments you or says they like something about you, um, just say thank you and take it in. Thank you. You know, like I've gotten to the point, which, and it's it really... It's not an arrogant thing, like Abner said, but sometimes people will say something that they enjoy about me, and I'm like, I really like that too. I like that too, you know? And that, and it's like, I don't have, you know, sometimes we want to be humble, but we don't want to be false humble, right? Like there's something about receiving it. And then I encourage you later when somebody says something, particularly about your character that they enjoy about you, go home 
and let the Lord speak that to you. God was speaking to you through that person and sit in that like, oh God, you really love that part about me. You know, so I just want to encourage us to take in compliments or when people bless us to receive it and not deflect it. So that's, that's one, one small thing. Um, I also just encourage you, it's, it's a powerful thing to bless somebody else. So I, I try to make it a practice, even small things. If there's somebody that does really great customer service, I just, you know, I was on the phone with this woman from Anthem and she was helping me with something in my insurance policy. I said, oh, you are so clear and you are so helpful to me. And so I just wanted to say, you are great at your job. And I really appreciate you know, how, how thoughtful and how much time you took and small things like sometimes it feels embarrassing or, at, you know, at the check stand, just sort of like, oh man, that sweater looks really beautiful on you, you know, but I don't know if you just, those compliments stay with people the rest of the day. They do. Our words are powerful. And so let's keep blessing one another with our words. Don't be generous with your words. Don't fake it, you know, but like when you feel it, say it, you know, last, I would say every my birthday was on Thursday, and I love my birthday. And I read Psalm 139 every year on my birthday, and I let the Lord bless me that way and, and just celebrate like, oh, and I just like, oh, Jesus, this is how you made me. And then I, this literally, this sounds cheesy, but this is how I feel internally. It's like, it's me. I'm so happy to be me. Oh, just that sense of like, oh, I love who God has made me. And I told you this, I love who you made me, you know? And so just let the Lord celebrate you on your birthday. I really encourage you, read the Psalm slowly on your birthday and let the Lord speak those words to you. We need that. We need that deeply. So a few encouragements. All right, a couple announcements. So we're going to see our calendar pretty similar. Genesis all the way through. <laughs> One thing that we do have that's not marked on here on the 22nd is Chinese New Year, and we are going to have a special lunch after the service just to celebrate Chinese New Year. Um, are we doing that as a potluck? Did we say? Oh, there's a shine-up sheet for the potluck in the back, and there, I don't know, yeah, is there was some maybe talk about dumpling making. I don't know. So if, <laughs> so no pressure, but if we might do that. Okay, so that will be fun. So stay after the service next week. Um, somebody else that's fearfully and wonderfully made is Amelia Bautista. So I told you guys, this is Erica and Bryant, and their son Isaiah is right here, and Joshua is right here. I just got to go to their house and bring them a meal last night. This is our daughter, Amelia, that was born on January 4th. So just wanted to share pictures with you. Um, and they're doing well. She said they're doing really well. And the older brothers are not, at least at this moment, jealous, but more helpful towards their mom. And, and that um, Amelia's doing well. And so people have been, they feel so loved. People have been bringing meals and donating money. So if you haven't got a chance to do that and you want to, you can sign up online. Um, but yes, and the, I think Erica might be with us online. So hi, Erica. Hi, Brian, if you're there. <laughs> uh, next, we have another baby announcement. Okay, next. Oh, well, yeah, you know what I mean. Go, go into the next one. Oh, no, not that one. Well, that one. Yay. So this is Amy and Anthony. Welcome their grandson into the world this last week um, on January 11th. And Titan, Titan, Titan Bronze. And so Amy's like, he has a lot to live up to. <laughs> so, and then there's a baby shower. Also, do you see, is there a slide? Oh, I put that in there. Okay. All right. Well, there's a baby shower that is coming for Jen and David, Sato Velos, and that is going to be on Sunday, February 11th at 11 a.m. at the Yao's house at Janelle and David's not Janelle and David's, that's Jen and David, Janelle and Sam's house in Glendora. So save the date. So it's a, we're, it's about a month away. We're a month from yesterday on a, did I say Sunday on it? It's a Saturday, sorry, Saturday, not during church. <laughs> that would be fun, but um, we're going to actually do it on Saturday, Saturday at 11 a.m. On, on February 11th. So save the date for that. There's also been an Evite that went out. So sign up for that. We just want to come around Jen and David. They're due in the beginning of April. So they're in those last months now. And we just want to come around them and shower them with so much love. They're having a baby girl. And um, so, yes, and they have a registry online. So let's shower them with gifts so that they have all that they need for their sweet girl coming into the world. Awesome. I think that is it. Oh, yeah, giving. Um, you can do it through checks. You can put it in the back. Um, Zelle or River of Life website. 
Um, if you need help figuring out Zelle, ask me um, how to do that, and I will do it simple enough, but it, sometimes you have to kind of have somebody walk you through it the first time. So let me go ahead and just pray this last blessing over us, and then we'll be done for today. Jesus, we just thank you for this time. God, it always feels like such a, uh, my heart feels full, I guess is what I feel. I feel full, and seeing one another makes my heart feel full, um, and laughing together sharing with one another, um, just worship and just lifting up who you are and also your word and just the way um, yeah, you show us of what's true of who you are, of what's true of the world and, and of who we are as well, Lord. So we just thank you for all these good gifts. And we just I just pray your blessing over us as we go for um, the rest of our day and this week. God, would we be able to walk in the truth that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that you enjoy us. I pray for that internal sense of like, it's me, that you just love who we are, that we would be able to walk in that. And I also pray that we would be able to reflect that to the people that we come in contact with, that we would be able to just really enjoy them and reflect with our body and our voice and our words um, that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen.